This is a lecture on the book of Zechariah, a book that gives visions for rebuilding the temple and for the eschatological future. My name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle. A bit of an introduction. The date of the book of Zechariah is roughly from 520 BC to 480 BC. Zechariah was a contemporary of Haggai, who, according to Ezra chapters 5 and 6, uh, the two together encouraged the Jews in 520 BC to rebuild the temple in the post exilic period dominated by Persia. Zechariah chapters 1 through 8 dates as follows. The first part in uh, chapter 1 dates to October November of 520 BC. And then starting in verse 17, it dates the night visions to February 15th of 519 BC. And then chapters about fasting date to December 7th of 518 BC. The last part of the book has two undated oracles, and these could be no later than about 480 BC, assuming Zechariah wrote the entire book. Now that raises the question of, did Zechariah write the entire book? Liberal critical scholars tend to argue that Zechariah did not write chapters 9 through 14, but they ascribe it to an anonymous author they call Deutero Zechariah, similar to what they say about the second part of Isaiah, which they call Deutero Isaiah. Liberals argue this on the basis of differences in style, content, and vocabulary. Matthew 27, 9 and 10 seems to attribute Zechariah 11 verses 12 and 13 to Jeremiah, and they would say this reflects a confused authorship tradition for this part of the book. Matthew 27, then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they use them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Conservatives, on the other hand, argued that Zechariah wrote the entire book. They think there's insufficient reason to posit a new author in chapter 9. And while it is true that Matthew is quoting from Zechariah chapter 11, and he mentions Jeremiah, it's probably the case that he's got a double allusion both to Zechariah and to Jeremiah 19, 1 through 13. And he refers to the less obvious quotation uh, from Jeremiah in his statement. The genre of the book of Zechariah is, like Daniel, much of Zechariah consists of highly symbolic, apocalyptic-like visions, making the book hard to interpret. Outline of the book. First six verses give an introduction to the book. And then in the rest of chapter 1 through chapter 6, you have eight night visions, which will have to do with the restoration of the temple. It will also refer to a messianic branch. In chapter 6, you have a symbolic crowning of Joshua, chapter 6, uh, 9 through 15 where the messianic branch is to remove sin in one day. And then you have the question of fasting in Zechariah 7 and 8. But then the last part of the book has two oracles on the future. The first section, 9 through 11, you have the triumphant intervention of the Lord, in which the good shepherd is rejected. A couple of messianic prophecies there. One, chapter 9, verse 9, that the Messiah is to come on a donkey. In Zechariah 11, 1 through 17, the good shepherd is sold for 30 shekels. In chapters 12 through 14, you have the final intervention of the Lord, where you have a description of the conversion of the Jews at the end of chapter 12 into chapter 13 which looks like it takes place at the second advent. And then you have the second coming of Christ to the Mount of Olives in chapter 14 and verse 3. We'll give a little more detail on this later. 
Zechariah begins with a very typical prophetic call to repentance. Verse 2, The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. Therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Now what follows is eight visions on the restoration of the temple, chapter 1, verse 7 through chapter 6 and verse 8. Though these visions are difficult to interpret, these night visions concentrate on the restoration of the temple, which had already begun at the time of the vision, but the Jews needed encouragement because there was opposition that threatened the work. The first vision was a vision of a man among the myrtles in chapter 1, verse 7 through 11. And the message of this vision was that God intended to establish peace in the world in order that the temple could be rebuilt. God will return to Jerusalem to dwell there, he says. And then you have the second vision of the horns and the craftsmen. You saw seven animals with horns and then seven craftsmen that came to cut off the horns. The animals with horns symbolize the nations that had terrified Judah, but now are themselves to be terrorized. Supernatural forces will produce a climate among the nations to allow the Jews to continue the temple work. The third vision is a vision of a surveyor, chapter 2, 1 through 13. Though Jerusalem would outgrow her boundaries, God will protect her. And the implication is, Go on and continued working on the temple rather than diverting effort to the city walls. The fourth vision is the vision of the coronation of Joshua, chapter 3, 1 through 10. This vision treats the issue, is it really possible to have a renewed priestly service after the priesthood was defiled among the nations? And the answer is going to be, yes, it is possible. God had plucked the high priest from the fire of exile for that very purpose, for the priesthood is symbolic of a far greater removal of sin through Messiah. And then the fifth vision, a vision of golden lampstand and olive tree. This unit serves to encourage the political leader, Zerubbabel, that though he lacks military or political might, God's Spirit would remove all obstacles, symbolized by mountains, and empower him, as well as the high priest Joshua, to complete the task of temple building. The sixth vision is a vision of a flying scroll. In conjunction with God's taking up residence again in his temple, God will allow the curse for disobedience to the covenant to operate with renewed vigor so that sinners who escaped human justice would receive divine justice. Here God deals with sin by punishment. The seventh vision is a vision of the ephah container with the woman called wickedness inside, chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. And the message here is that God would remove wickedness from the land. Now, this is probably in conjunction with the renewal of true worship, when the teaching of the law brings repentance and spiritual renewal. Here God deals with sin by forgiveness. And then the eighth vision is a vision of four chariots. And the message is that God is going to accomplish his will among the nations who have hindered the Jews. Specifically, neither Persia, reached by the road north, nor Egypt, reached by the road south, would prevent the temple project from being completed. I'd like to look at some selected passages among these night visions. Chapter 3, 8 through 10 has a little messianic prophecy about the branch. Listen, O high priest, Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant the branch. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua? 
There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Branch is a messianic title. It's used that way here. It's used that way again in chapter 6. And it's also used in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah 11 and verse 1 and Jeremiah 23 verse 5 and 33 verse 15. Thus it becomes sort of a stock messianic title. But the connection here is with the priesthood. The priesthood was important because it symbolized something the messianic branch would do. He would remove the sin of this land in a single day. And this is ultimately fulfilled by the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who, as well as being a king, is also a priest. And on Good Friday, Jesus does indeed remove the sin of the land in a single day on Good Friday. Zechariah chapter 4 is a prophecy about Joshua and Zerubbabel as God's anointed ones. Verse 2, he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lights on it with seven channels to the lights. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, O mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to the shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Again I ask him, what are these two olive branches besides the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two that are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. A little bit about this message. Zechariah 4 is a vision about Joshua and Zerubbabel, the Lord's anointed ones. And the central point is to encourage Zerubbabel, along with Joshua, in building the temple. They are the two olive trees that are mentioned here. That though Zerubbabel in particular lacks military or political might, that God's Spirit would empower him to rebuild the temple, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, verse 6. Now, the interpretive details elsewhere are a little harder to pin down, but here's some suggested interpretations. The mountain is symbolic of difficulties that lies before Zerubbabel. Note that this shows the metaphorical meanings of Jesus' statement about when you pray, you can move mountains. The olive tree and its branches stand for the priesthood of Joshua, the high priest, and the leadership of Zerubbabel, the governor, the Lord's anointed ones. The pipes between the olives to the lampstand symbolize the inflow of oil from the olives that in turn symbolizes the work and power of the Holy Spirit. The oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit that will empower Joshua and Zerubbabel to accomplish the purposes that God has for them in rebuilding the temple. The lampstand perhaps symbolizes the Jewish community's witness to the world especially its witness through the temple. Might compare Revelation 1, where lampstands represent churches. Let me move on to Zechariah chapter 6, 11 through 13, which comes back to the branch. And the branch is a priest-king in this particular case. 
Verse 11, Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is Branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne, and he will be a priest on his throne, and there will be harmony between the two offices." The circumstance of this prophecy was the visit of certain dignitaries from the Jews of Babylonia to present a gift to the temple in Jerusalem. A crown was placed on Joshua's head from the gold and silver donated by these exiles, and this was used to symbolize what the messianic branch would be. Again, branch is a messianic title. This passage picks up on that from chapter 3 and verse 8, where Messiah removes sin from the land in a single day. So this branch, or Messiah, will also be a priest king. The branch will bear the glory as king. He will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. But he will also have a priestly role. Thus, Zechariah 3 and 6 together emphasize that the Messiah is both a priest and a king. Psalm 110 and the parallels in Hebrews speaks about Christ as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Zechariah chapter 7 and 8 deal with the question of fasting. And the question was this, was it okay for the returned exiles to continue to commemorate the fast that remembered the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, given that the new temple was in progress of being rebuilt? And God's answer is this, that first, that fasting must seek God. No fast is legitimate unless the motive is really to seek God. Fasting for self-pity or to look pious doesn't count. Two, justice is more important than fasting. Fasting by those who do not treat other people decently is condemned, verses 8 through 14. This is why God does not answer their prayer despite their fasting. Justice is more important than rituals such as fasting. In chapter 8, he gets to the answer that the focus should be on future blessings, not past disasters. Given that God has a glorious future plan for Jerusalem, chapter 8, 1 through 17, there's no longer a need to fast to commemorate Israel's tragic past, verses 18 through 23. Let me move on to the last part of the book that consists of two oracles about the distant future. The first oracle is the triumphant intervention of the Lord in which the shepherd is rejected in chapters 9 through 11. Beginning with the prefiguring of Alexander's invasion in chapter 9, the prophet goes on to see one greater than Alexander who would be humble and usher in peace. God would use the Maccabees to humble the Greeks chapter 9, verse 11 through 10, 1, as God works to redeem and unite his people, chapter 10. But since the leaders of Israel would prove corrupt, God would send the good shepherd, the Messiah, who would really care for the sheep, but the shepherd would be rejected, bringing judgment on the sheep. Some details. The Messianic prophecy in chapter 9 and verse 9, in which Messiah comes on a donkey, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Messiah will come, not on a war horse like Alexander does, Alexander being prophesied about in the verses before these, but he's going to come on a humble donkey, and this is fulfilled by Jesus' triumphal entry, which is recorded in Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12, all of which allude back 
to this prophecy by Zechariah. There's also a messianic passage in Zechariah 11 in which the good shepherd is sold for 30 shekels. Zechariah 11 and verse 10. Then I took my staff called favor and broke it, revoking the covenant I had made with all the nations. It was revoked on that day, and so the afflicted of the flock who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. This is a description of a good shepherd who's bought off for 30 shekels of silver though the money is thrown to the potter. And so in the New Testament, Judas betrays Jesus for 30 shekels, Matthew 26, 15, though he later throws away the money and it was given to the graveyard for the poor in a place called the potter's field, Matthew 27, 5 through 10, thus fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy. The last three chapters, chapters 12 through 14, describe a final intervention of the Lord in a eschatological section. In chapter 12, Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies, but God would act supernaturally to save his people. And this corresponds to events around the Battle of Armageddon and the end time battles in the book of Revelation. But then there's a little messianic passage in chapter 12 and verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. This overall section says that at this time, Jews of all social standings will mourn in repentance and receive cleansing from sin. The Jews will look on God whom they have pierced. John chapter 19 verses 34 through 37 sees the fulfillment of this language when the soldiers pierced Jesus' corpse with a spear, and thus they will look upon him whom they have pierced. But notice that in Zechariah, it's Yahweh that they have pierced. John is thus equating Jesus with Yahweh in applying this verse to Jesus. This prophecy about the cleansing of Jews of all social standings at this time that follows this verse may relate to the conversion of Israel at the second coming of Christ. The context of all three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, seems to be eschatological. Chapter 13, 2 through 9, talks about false prophets and, in contrast, the good shepherd. There had been false prophets, but they will become ashamed of themselves. Though the good shepherd had been rejected and the sheep scattered, through this process, God would refine his people. Jesus cites this passage and applies it to himself. In Zechariah 13 and verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. But then Jesus applies this language to himself in Matthew 26, 31. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Final chapter, chapter 14, seems to talk about the final consummation of things. Returning to the eschatological battle, which began to be discussed in chapter 12, when God comes, he will come to the Mount of Olives, where his feet will touch the ground and cause dramatic effects. 
Waters of blessings will then flow from Jerusalem. The Lord will reign as king of the earth. The wicked will be judged, their flesh rotting while they stand. And the holy kingdom of God will be established where the whole world worships God. And Judah and Jerusalem will be holy to the Lord. Thus is the hope Zechariah lays before his readers. A little bit about the Messianic implication of this. In Zechariah 14 and verse 3, God comes to the Mount of Olives. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. It relates to an eschatological battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation. And the fulfillment is when Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives just as he ascended into heaven from there in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. And so in Acts chapter 1, just before he ascended, they ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates uh, that he has. After that, he was taken up before them and their very eyes in a cloud hid him from their sight. And as they were looking intently into the sky as he was going, then suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Those are angels. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. Just as Jesus ascended into heaven, so he will return from heaven at the second coming and return in just the same way, which suggests that he returns to the Mount of Olives. Just as in Zechariah 14.3, the Lord will land on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. Well, that's an introduction to the book of Zechariah by me, and my name is Dr. Joe Sprinkle.